we would like to thank Mr. James Godber, who is here, who will we'll be driving the next uh, you know, half an hour. Uh, small brief, Mr. James Godber is first secretary and deputy head of the India Science and Innovation Network, based in the British Deputy High Commission uh, in Bengaluru. Uh, James' remit is to work to deliver science partnerships between the UK and India. Previously posted to both Beijing and Doha, James was most recently working in the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office's National Security Directorate in London as part of the Cyber Policy Department. He's also worked for the UK Department for Environment, Food and Ru Rural Affairs. James holds a BSc from the University of York in Environmental Economics and Environmental Management and an MRS degree in Science of Environment from Lancaster University. Thank you for your time today and we look forward uh, you know, to your interaction, post which we might have a two presentations from our students. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pull up the chair because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I hope that this can be interactive and uh, that you will ask questions of me rather than me just provide a monologue, uh, because that will be more fun for me and probably for you too, and help you stay awake as we move towards, as we move towards lunch. But firstly, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to Triple ITB uh, this morning. It's a great pleasure to come here again and to have the opportunity to engage with you as you're going through your studies and thinking about uh, how and if you might want to begin uh, an innovation entrepreneurship journey. Um, in terms of my thinking and what I'm going to say uh, to you, I think there are three key elements uh, to the remarks I'm going to make. I'm going to talk first a little bit about the UK's domestic policy around uh, framing our science research work just at the moment. I'm then going to talk about what the UK is trying to do in India and lastly I'm going to touch on some engagement opportunities. Um, but if you want to interrupt me at any point just pop up a hand. I'm very happy to uh, see hands go up uh, and I will probably only talk for five to ten minutes so please do try and stay awake. If I see anyone nodding off I might throw something as, uh, as my teachers used to do to me when I was at school long ago. So, um, UK uh, national policy just at the moment, obviously putting all of everything going on with to do with Brexit to one side. Um, back at the end of 2017, significantly the UK announced a new industrial strategy. And uh, while I was listening to uh, the last presenter in the first session this morning, I looked at the industrial strategy and refreshed myself on what that said and how and why it was relevant. And it says that the industrial strategy aims to boost productivity by backing businesses to create good jobs and inc increase the earning power of people through an investment in skills, industries and infrastructure. So this is about a transformational way in which the UK can uh, continue to disseminate wealth and build wealth for the population. Um, there was a review of the first months of the industrial strategy that took place at the end of last year, uh, which is all online, and those of you who are interested can find it. It's called Forging Our Future, uh, because all policy documents in the UK have slightly kitsch sounding, uh, sounding names. Um, and at the front, in the, in the preface to that document, there's again a series of quotations from Mrs May, uh, where she says, our challenge as a nation is to lead the world in the fourth industrial revolution and ensure that every part of the country powers that success. And I think that statement sums up for me what this, what this is all about, what the industrial strategy is all about. All of our countries want to do the best for our people, so of course there is an inherent level of competition in what we're trying to do. How can we leverage the skills that we've got in the UK and position the UK on the world stage? Um, the UK's relationship with India is complicated, um, but uh, we've got a brilliant shared history and that gives us a great deal to build on going forward. And for me then personally, Mrs May's statement is about how can I work with you to make sure that we are together building the UK's future, but also doing that in doing that building uh, India's future. The, the, the reference to every part of the country is also really important to me because uh, whilst the UK is geographically a very small country uh, relative to India and has a population only roughly equivalent to the size of the state of Karnataka, uh, we see huge disparity in where investments take place. Um, 
The government has been working over the last 20 odd years to try and address that, to try and make sure that more wealth is being developed in the north, in the southwest, and it isn't uh, focused exclusively on London and the southeast of the country. But of course, where there is a gravity, as we see here in this city, where there is a coalescence of capability, then other people want to come and be a part of that. And that's very natural. So there's a, there's a policy tension that we're exploring in the UK. How can we create new clusters, new areas of excellence that fall outside of the southeast, where we can identify uh, new thematic foci for people to work on that benefit uh, the populations in areas all across the country. Uh, and I'm thinking, that when I say country, whilst I am an Englishman, I am thinking about, of course, about the United Kingdom, so including Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in that. While I was skimming over the report, I saw a number of really cool facts that are, I think are probably pertinent to, to you and the, the thinking that you're doing. Uh, so I'll share just a few of those with you. Um, they sort of showcase the scale of the opportunity that's in the UK. The first one, AI technology could add 630 billion pounds to the value of the UK economy by 2035. So in just over 15 years time, 630 billion pounds put onto the bottom line of the UK uh, through embracing AI. And that seemed to me to be a really pertinent fact to raise in this environment in Triple ITB today, given the work that you're all doing. Um, alongside that, 1,100 new businesses are launched every day in the UK. That's one every 75 seconds. So I'm not sure what the success rate of those new businesses are, but we talk about Bangalore as the entrepreneurial capital of, uh, of your country, of this country. Um, in the UK, we're still seeing a huge number of new businesses being developed every day. And a great many of those are going to be leveraging the UK's historic and future technology capabilities um, and trying to put those to good effect. The last stat that I thought was really telling uh, from this report was that in the first 12 months since the launch of the industrial strategy, the challenge fund that's been created, so government money that's been put to one side to help deliver the industrial strategy, has invested £652 million in 602 projects. So almost a million pounds per intervention, 600 discrete interventions to, to move forward the UK's economy and ensure that this wealth uh, and opportunity that comes with digitalization and everything else happening uh, is spread around the UK writ large. Yesterday when I was mulling over what I was going to say, I was looking back at some older statistics and apparently the value of UK tech R&D investment is £33 billion a year. So another huge, huge figure. Don't ask me to work out what that is in rupees because just equating and crore and lakh blows my mind every time. Uh, but £33 billion, 33,000 million sterling is a phenomenal amount of R&D investment and approximately one third of that is government money. We have a target uh, to reach 2.4% uh, of total GDP spend being allocated to research and development by 2027. Don't ask me why 2027 is the year um, because I'm really not sure on that. But eight years time, 2.4% of our GDP spent on R&D, approximately uh, not dissimilar amounts of money that we're going to spend on overseas development assistance annually around the world. So huge commitment by the UK government to research and development. So in the context of this industrial strategy, the government's then honed in on what they're calling grand challenges, areas where they think uh, there is a real imperative for new research work to make sure that the UK can fulfil that sort of ambition as being uh, creating new jobs and being at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and those grand challenges are focused in the areas of artificial intelligence, around ageing, uh, where I think 55% of the population are now over 50 in the UK, uh, mobility, 
and clean energy and distributed energy, I think, particularly within that. So the Grand Challenge Research Fund is then driving new money into uh, businesses, into academic research institutions to support new work in those areas. And those areas are really important to me in terms of how I think about my job in terms of building science partnerships with India. So perhaps that's enough on the UK context. Perhaps we then segue into uh, what is it that the UK is looking to do in India. So as, uh, as was said in the introduction, I'm the deputy head of the India Science and Innovation Network. I'm here with my colleagues Vikram and uh, Sunil. Uh, and I'm permanently based here in Bengaluru. Uh, I've been here for about 15 months, and I'll be here for at least another two years, probably three. Uh, that's a choice, and I like it, so I, I'm expecting to stay for a third year unless anybody sends me home for bad behavior. Um, and uh, what we, as part of the Science and Innovation Network, are looking to do, I've got one other UK colleague who's based in Delhi. Uh, what we're looking to do is to build new partnerships, as I've said, and we are working across uh, six thematic areas that we think deliver potential uh, for really positive, tangible collaboration. Uh, they are digital and AI. They are uh, precision agriculture, uh, future mobility. They are future manufacturing, so manufacturing 4.0 and, and all that goes on in that. Uh, they are healthcare and life sciences work. And the last one is uh, oceans, around uh, the work that we can do to better understand our oceans and also clean our oceans to ensure s sustainability. You'll see from that list, if you can think back to the grand challenges, that there's a good overlap between what we're looking to do in country and the areas where we're looking to work bilaterally with India and the areas of importance uh, as perceived from, from London. Our budget, the budget that we have as a team, is very small. Uh, a couple of hundred thousand pounds in a good year, less in a bad year. Uh, and we use that money to support, uh, to take delegations of brilliant people from India to the UK to understand what's going on uh, in, our, in our market and to bring scientific, scientists and scientific researchers from the UK here to India to understand what you're doing. And when they come here, that includes visiting uh, the institutions in this city and potentially coming here to triple ITB to understand the research that you're undertaking and how that might relate to their business models uh, and the work that they're and the work that they're planning um, so that's the science and innovation network those of you with reasonably long memories uh, beyond the immediate will remember that uh, mr. Modi went to London last April and when he went to London he launched a new technology partnership the technology partnership was the outcome of uh, quite a lot of introspection, I think, from the High Commissioner in Delhi and, and our large team here in India, which is over a thousand, thousand staff working for the UK here in India, <laughs> about what should be the UK's USP for a 21st century uh, country as big and powerful as India is already and will grow to be uh, in the future. And we thought that the area where we really had something still to offer India and were really relevant and could help effect change here for both of our collective benefits was technology. So we launched this new technology partnership and there are six or seven elements to the tech partnership and I will try and remember them. Uh, but they include uh, a huge technology festival that we held in Delhi uh, in uh, December that Professor Srinath attended and spoke at uh, for us. Um, he spoke about the benefits of cluster partnering and tech clusters as a way of driving forward new innovation. Um, that's, that's the most sort of short term and the easiest in many ways to, to make happen. Uh, the others are, are more complicated. Uh, there is uh, an ambition which is currently underway to support uh, the aspirational health districts through the provision of AI technologies to two of India's aspirational health districts uh, to improve frontline medical services for people in remote areas. And so there are British businesses and institutions paired up now with uh, two, two districts doing, doing that and looking at how we can apply UK developed AI technology to solving problems of, of uh, access to healthcare uh, here in India. 
there is uh, a program which Sunil is leading to deliver um, a future manufacturing center here in India. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with how the UK brings development out of academic institutions, and perhaps it's worth exploring that through the questions and answers. But we have what we call a catapult network in the UK, which looks at seven or eight areas of our economy, one of which is future manufacturing or high value manufacturing. And those catapult networks uh, and institutions help support in differing ways uh, business development through TRL 4, 5, 6, 7. And through that valley of death, it's sort of government support to help new IP become a commercial reality. And the government puts in a third of the money into those ventures. Uh, a third then is raised privately and a third comes from uh, the business itself uh, in order to help the commercialization of new tech. And we're looking to do this jointly with India by creating a center with a footprint here in India and a footprint in the UK so that we can match up businesses that are looking to do similar things. Uh, and we're also looking to create a knowledge transfer network alongside that so that we can not only um, put people in touch at the point of developing that new IP, but we might also put people in touch who've run similar experimentation in one location with those in another and say, you know, you'd really benefit by going to talk to Professor X in this market because they've already done a lot of what you're looking to do and it might save a huge amount of your, of your investment cost if you just go and have a conversation around how they framed that experiment or what they, what they did. So we're creating a knowledge transfer network there as well. Tech Partnership is also looking at creating a technology hub which is uh, effectively an office which is going to look for brilliant people like you uh, who are going to be at the point of commercializing your IP. You're at, towards the end of that tech readiness level. You know, you're at eight, nine, 10. You're looking for investment. You might be looking to internationalize your business and the tech hub will be really interested in understanding what it is that you're doing and how that might be relevant to a UK market and helping you then take that business concept to the UK. Um, and then last one that I'm going to talk about is the Tech Cluster Partnership, which I've talked about in this room uh, before, uh, which is about facilitating ecosystem-wide exchange. Um, and we're looking to do that in two areas and across two geographies. So what do I mean when I say ecosystem-wide exchange? Involving everybody from the academic institution through the major businesses like Infosys uh, down the road, and then the startups that fall out of the good research that's being done and partnering that whole community with the UK potentially to help look at those grand challenges. So putting out some new finance to say who wants to come and help work to look at this problem and partner with UK institutions or individuals to address uh, issues but on a semi-commercial uh, basis. We're looking, uh, we've got two of those that we've started to work on. Uh, that's a bridge between Karnataka to the north of England. We call that area the Northern Powerhouse. Uh, but everything from Liverpool uh, in the west through to Newcastle in the east, uh, which is focused on artificial intelligence and data. And a separate bridge between Maharashtra and the Midlands, which is focused on future mobility. Uh, so that's obviously looking particularly around Pune and then uh, the cities in the UK that have the industrial heritage and ve vehicular uh, research heritage where we've produced a lot of cars. Uh, in the UK. I think there's still 30, as an aside, I think there's still approximately 30. You know, everybody thinks, well, the UK's in industri industrial uh, past is very much behind it, but there are 30 uh, different marks that produce vehicles in the UK. So in terms of uh, automotive engineering, still a huge amount of innovation taking place in the UK and going on. Um, so that's sort of the tech partnership, the wider science and innovation network. Last thing that I'll say about uh, UK and India, we've also got a research office. Uh, early last year in 2018, our research councils were brought together under a new banner called UK Research and Innovation. They were brought together with Innovate, which is our business support arm that helps fund these catapults that I've already mentioned. And they now manage a huge amount of government money in terms of 
um, targeting research uh, in academic institutions and helping bring that research out into the commercial marketplace. We have an office in New Delhi of UK RI staff who are engaging daily with DBT. In fact, we've got a, a UK RI implant in DBT and then a whole range of other nine ministries, including DST, very obviously, in uh, Delhi to guide that spend. So last thing that I said that I'd talk about was engagement opportunities and what does all of this mean? Um, three elements I think it's worth touching on in that. Uh, the first is what's called the Newton-Baba partnership, which you may have heard of. So the bulk of the UKRI research money that we spend in country, uh, we spend through a joint framework, which is agreed with DST, where we agree joint priorities called Newton-Baba. I'm not brilliantly versed in Newton-Baba, so I'm going to look at my colleagues uh, slide pack to remind me of the details, but we have spent £735 million, or we will have done by 2021, through the Newton Fund internationally, of which Newton Baba is a part. Um, we spend the Newton Fund in 17 countries, uh, and we get match funding in, I think, almost all of those countries to give 50% equivalents for what the UK is spending. So. Um, that's 1.5 billion in aggregate spent across uh, those 17 countries. Um, to date, we've committed 104 million through Newton in India, which has been matched by um, Indian partners. So 200 million pounds in bilateral joint funded research. Um, and we run this partner, or we run these partnerships in a range of countries, Mexico, Brazil, Vietnam, Malaysia, South Africa, China, India, uh, and a small selection of others. Um, the pillars of Newton and all of that work is focused around people, so skilling, research, innovation, and translation, commercialization, uh, very simply. And there are four areas where we're spending that money uh, here for priority areas and two that are sort of wraparounds. The four priority areas in India are sustainable cities and urbanization, public health and well-being, the energy, water, food nexus, and understanding oceans. And then looping around those are big data, again very obviously <coughs> pertinent here, and high value manufacturing. Um, and we've got a huge list if I bought this as a slide pack, you could see, but of familiar Indian partners, government ministries, uh, FIKI, um, IISER Pune, and others who are involved in helping us disperse that money and make decisions on who to, which projects and programs to support in country. And there's a similarly, uh, or a similar map of UK partners who are helping us deliver, each leading on a particular theme. Uh, in, in the UK. So that's, that's really uh, Newton. If anybody has any questions around that, then I'd be very happy to put you in touch with my colleagues in Delhi. But we've awarded to date over 3,000 grants around the world, uh, and these projects have taken place in over 29 uh, states and union territories, uh, and we've got 40 joint programs in country at the moment. So real diversity in terms of what we're doing doing there. Perhaps more tangibly though for you as a, as a community is our Tech Rocket Ships program which we run each year where we support a handful, I'm not sure of the exact number, but let's say five to six uh, market ready business ideas and businesses to go to the UK and understand about the UK market. It's a competitive program. Uh, if you've got an idea that you're looking to commercialise and you think the UK is a market where might, we might be able to help you in either the uh, research phase or in terms of deployment, then uh, do look up the Tech Rocket Ships. It's all available online how it works. Um, but we've taken uh, businesses looking at natural language processing, for example, to the UK to look at how that AI tech might be rolled out in a UK context and to help them learn from some of the communities in the UK that are doing similar work about how uh, that UK work might benefit them in, in developing their business models. So that's a really interesting 
uh, relatively small program, but that might be of interesting interest to you if you do decide uh, that you're interested in entrepreneurship yourself. And the last, the very last thing that I want to talk about is a program called iCure, um, which is innovation and commercialization of university research. So this is a program that runs in the UK uh, at the moment, and it's, it's not targeting students. It is targeting early career researchers, but there's no reason why you couldn't create a similar program uh, for, for student projects. Uh, and what iCure does is you've got your new IP, you've developed your intellectual property through your research program, and you think that, that the problem set that you think that you've, you know, your IP is designed to solve has some international application. So you apply uh, to iCure and your idea is assessed by a panel and they help you decide which market you might want to take that IP to. And they then fund those early career researchers in the context of the existing program to go to that country and to learn for three months, let's say, about what's happening in that country and effectively to soft market test that IP in, in country. And then when they've done that, when the researcher has got that knowledge of the Indian or Chinese or any other market around the world, they return to the UK and they sit before a panel and they work with that panel to help determine how best to what to do with that IP. Do, do you actually want to continue to own it and run a business for yourself? Or do you want to license that IP to somebody else to take internationally? Do you want to create a spin out where you se you're selling up from the get go uh, because you're selling the IP to somebody else and somebody else is running the spin out? Or do you want to be a part of it? And there is a panel of business and academic researchers in the UK that sit and help these early career academics work out what's in their best interest given their other research links, how can they maximise the potential of that IP that they've developed and uh, showcase it internationally. And I thought that that was a, a useful point perhaps with which to stop uh, because it seemed to come together quite nicely with the ideals of RISE uh, as being something that maybe the government of Karnataka or the government of India might want to be uh, looking at or could be persuaded to look at perhaps with UK help demonstrating the UK model. Really very happy to take any questions. I hope I've not bored you all to sleep uh, and I wish you every success in your future endeavours. So I think, um, thanks for uh, providing an incredible amount of information and the opportunities that are available for, for us to work across. Um, uh, I think, um, two, 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 one, one is a request, so I think if your office can consolidate all this information and share it with, uh, say, Karthik, and we will disseminate it across our own community. Um, the second aspect is uh, all said and done, uh, establishing this international, tapping into these international opportunities can be a bit intimidating, to say the least, uh, in terms of the processes and the procedures that might uh, have to go through. Um, so one suggestion I had was for many of these initiatives, I'm assuming there will be periodic calls that go out. Um, if it is not there, I would suggest that we should structure them along this way. Uh, uh, see, one way is to do is to see. Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse uh, me. Interested. So, as and when people are ready to seek help, they'll come to you and then you can guide them. That is one model, any way which you can continue to do. Um, another. Uh, Suggestion is that if you have periodic calls saying that you know, kind of quarterly, uh, no, biannually or annually, so you have these programs that keep rolling out. Uh, so then uh, some of us can guide our students or whoever uh, to take advantage of those things. We can say that um, you know academics are driven by deadlines. So for conference publications, that's how we work. So there's a conference deadline, then we put something together and push it out. So if there are such things that are published and announced, I think uh, it will be very, very useful. And 
The last thing is if there are success stories which uh, specifically from a local context, maybe starting with Bangalore or expanding into Karnataka, uh, where people, um, startups or students or all the, you know, these uh, who have taken advantage of it and benefited from them. So it will be easier to establish uh, you know, networks, you know, they, um, so that we can flock together and uh, go forward and benefit. But um, thank you very much for um, opening up so many opportunities for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, for those thoughts and sort of the questions interwoven uh, within them. A, a couple of things uh, I guess it's worth uh, saying at this point. The first is that the tech partnership that was announced last year has about £14 million uh, allocated to it, uh, which will include the creation of this new tech hub. Um, will include the operation of these tech clusters. And at the moment, that money hasn't been released because within government, we're still working out the, the business case to unlock the money so that we can start to, to spend and refining exactly the sort of operations of how those uh, programs should work in order to deliver maximum effect. But uh, this institution is very much at the front of my mind in terms of how uh, we can make that uh, work in due course and we will of course be sharing um, or signposting where there are opportunities that arise. I think the tech hub, my, my understanding as to how the tech hub might work would be that they will travel the country uh, and that sounds very grand but over time and, and talk with the major institutions and learn through engagement where are the businesses that are potentially market ready and then begin to have conversations with them and then you know they'll be bridging helping to bridge or broker interaction between those businesses and UK VC investors or landing pads in the UK which might provide um, the sorts of opportunities or comfort blankets maybe that are needed to help those businesses make that make that challenging step to go international um, but I'm not sure, outside of the research space, there isn't at the moment a sort of a calls process. I don't think there's any problem with me telling you this story. Um, uh, I'm recognising I'm being recorded, but I think it's fine. Uh, I had a representative from Axelor come and see us in the office a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I was really struck because the person that came to see us uh, was talking about how you know Chris Gopal Krishnan and Axelor are trying to build their portfolio of of startup ventures, and they're starting to think very naturally, like many in this city, about how can we help them to internationalise. And the uh, question that was put was, is there a playbook uh, that would that you can sort of make available as the UK to help? And I think the answer is no. You know, our market isn't sophisticated enough to have, uh, or, to, or big enough almost to justify the creation of a playbook and a one size fits all, follow these seven steps and you will, you will reach heaven or nirvana. You know, that, that, that doesn't uh, exist yet at the moment. It may never exist. But it did remind me, in having that conversation around, about iCure and the, the way in which we are looking to help uh, UK academic IP being commercialised. And I did begin to wonder whether there might be a gap or a need for a programme whereby, through our exchange government uh, institution, we are... Uh, recognising when there might be ventures that are looking to the UK and helping put you corporately in touch with researchers in the UK, academics and small businesses in a similar space who could provide mentorship and uh, pastoral kind of supervision to help those individuals and businesses to grow in the UK. We ran a programme 
uh, in China a number of years ago called, it was, called the, it was run from Lancaster University and it was called the Lancaster China Partnership. And what they were looking to do in that instance was help small UK businesses find new solutions to problems that they faced by partnering those businesses with either academic or business partners in Guangdong province in South East China. And I can see a real opportunity to do something similar in India, possibly in a two-way. That worked only one way. It was UK businesses looking to China for, for solutions and effectively buying the solution. But we could, we could look to try and work out whether there's potential to do something that was a bilateral exchange scheme where we were taking businesses in both directions. It just won't happen quickly. Other questions from around the room? I have one. Uh, so, I referred twice about uh, you know, helping startups uh, do business in the uh, UK uh, by introducing them to probably potential investors. And then you talked about Tech Rocket Ship, uh, that program where you are taking them. So, are both of the programs the same or is it different? That was one question. After that, uh, is, uh, can you explain more about the process? You know, what is involved in how you select it, do you use it, but you do it yourself? Uh, so that it, uh, it can help us to understand you know, what is the process involved. Uh, at least we feel there is something we have created which is relevant uh, uh, for Europe. Uh, it deals with GDPR, and we would like to see how we can, uh, whom we can approach to help, uh, at least guide us you know, how to do business in. So there is a definitive program in tech rocket ships. Then there's a sort of an opportunity for government to provide more advice on an ad hoc basis. So they're not the same, but neither is there a startup support initiative that's broader than, than tech rocket ships at the moment on our list of things that we, we do. That being said, if you as a business were to talk to my colleagues in the Department for International Trade uh, about, your, about your business. If you're looking to create jobs in the UK by looking at the UK market, and when I say jobs, I mean anything from one job upwards. So you may be a three-man business at the moment. If your fourth person is going to be somebody based in the UK, then the Department for International Trade are there and available and willing to talk with you and help you uh, understand that market. Many services are chargeable, many are not. Uh, so please don't be turned off by the idea that, uh, you know, to, to talk to DIT you might end up with chargeable services. There's no guarantee they can help, but if they like what you're look, looking to do, then there's every possibility that they will uh, do some informal introductions to people at the UK side or signpost you to some of the uh, tech hub opportunities that there are in the UK way, which would be landing pads and so on, accelerators, where you might want to locate yourself uh, at relatively low cost to benefit from a, an ecosystem sort of turnkey type uh, change. So do get in touch. Well, thank you again. If there's no more questions, I should say thank you again very much for your attention and all the best in your works. <laughs>